Yeah, so my name is Jeremy. So first of all, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I've got a huge passion for the Finnish game industry. I think you guys are some of the best. So I'm really honored and humbled to be here, and I'm really excited to meet a lot of you uh, during the next two days. So we actually changed the title of, of this talk. It's from casual publisher to entertainment powerhouse, uh, how we're expanding. The last two talks were great because it bridges a lot of questions about like, you know, how do you raise capital, what type of like partner you need to align yourself with, um, and we just wanted to give you kind of like an update on the current state of the market, where it's going, and how we're positioning ourselves uh, in that very competitive market. So, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I've worked for a couple of really cool companies. I'm obviously French, having worked at Ubisoft and Gameloft. I was the general manager of Tinyco, and we got acquired uh, by Jam City, and now I'm the vice president uh, of Jam City. I've worked on some really cool games. Uh, I think now I'm like a really a specialist when it comes to really big IPs. I've worked on Marvel, I worked on Harry Potter, Oregon Trail, uh, a lot of things that are not here. Um, so if ever you have questions about like IPs and how to partner with them, we can talk about it later. I'll just be walking around, so feel free to just grab me. So about us, Jam City, we're uh, kind of like a creative powerhouse. We define ourselves no longer as a, as a gaming company, but as an entertainment company. And I, we think that's where we want to grow the company, uh, even outside of mobile, just in your everyday life. And we've seen some of the biggest and highest grossing games on mobile platform and some of the most enduring social gaming franchise uh, for mobile. We're over 500 employees. I think now we're actually 550. Um, we've got studios in San Francisco, LA, San Diego, Buenos Aires, Bogota. Um, we're a really fun company. I think one part of our success has been how well we take care of people and how well we want them to like, enjoy their day-to-day -day work uh, at the company. You can see like our summer party where obviously my team won the trophy and I just want that to be recorded because I'll show it to everybody. Um, We've got some really cool games. Uh, you know, this year we released Harry Potter, and I'm sure you've heard about it. It's performing really well. Uh, critically, it has been really well received. It's at like 4.7 stars on uh, the App Store. But we also have, you know, really big franchises like Panda Pop and Cookie Jam that have lasted over like five or six years now, and those products are growing, and we're perfecting them even now, which I think says a lot about the state of the industry where. We are moving for games that have a higher and higher and longer uh, LTV, and we want to make sure that those uh, franchises keep on building. Um, Harry Potter, so a couple of records on that product. We did over 3 million pre-reg. Um, that has been the highest number so far of pre-registration. We're really happy about that. Top, top two uh, grossing game in the United States and a blockbuster success around the globe. Surprisingly, super successful in Asia. Uh, it's something we expected, but maybe not as high. And some of the largest marketing, we received a couple of awards for what we've done on Snapchat and on Instagram. And we're like doing a lot more and it's paying off with a lot of really cool featurings. Uh, even I think last week, we got a really cool one, one of those top breaks on, on Apple. Um, you know, that's a bit of a, a funny topic, but we moved across the street. We are uh, tripling our space. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that is that when we started Jam City, we were like five people in a single room, and we we're all sharing our office, uh, and now we all have our own offices. But it just shows how like, the game industry has changed and how the big companies are just getting bigger and how the market is consolidating. So. Please come visit. Uh, if ever you're in LA, just shoot me an email, uh, and we'll get you coffee in LA. So now I was saying how the market has changed. But in 95, there were 100 million uh, gamers worldwide, and now there's 2.5 billion. Um, and that's l basically less than, like, almost half of the 4.5 billion mobile devices owners. So the market is going to keep on growing. More and more people are going to become familiar with mobile gaming. And as India and other um, countries kind of rise, uh, the user base that is going to be interacting with your games is just going to keep on uh, increasing. I think the reason gaming on mobile has been so successful is really, and you guys know it's obvious, but it's the ubiquity of mobile devices as gateways to everything consumer wants. The entertainment, it's the achievement, it's the social interaction. Um, so what is currently like the state of the mobile market? Um, 90% of Google Play revenue, 75% of Apple App Store revenue in 2017. So I think all of the big players, the big app stores are aligned with game companies. They want to push the products up because they see the return on investment. And that's just going to keep on growing. So that's really, really good. We all know that uh, 
the market is growing, gamers will spend over $70 billion in 2019, and the trends are accelerating. It's planned to be over at $100 billion uh, by 2021. It's the only vertical right now with 10 years of double-digit growth. I think the challenge really is uh, that the market is consolidating, right? We see less and less small developers succeeding. Um, we've seen it in Finland where I think you guys have close to 200 mobile game companies, or maybe it's just company, game companies, but there's actually very few that now really succeed. Small Giant is the example right now that really have pierced uh, above the threshold, but all of the big players are starting to acquire more and more of the companies. So Fox Next acquired Aftershock, Niantic acquired Seismic Game, Blue Hole acquired Delusion, Adult Swim, Big Pixel in London, Zynga acquired Gram Games, Ubisoft acquired like 1492 Studios. Talent is so hard to acquire that really the big players, instead of like opening more game studio like we've seen Zynga doing um, a couple of years ago, now they're just acquiring, they're acquiring really great teams. So I think that's a really good sign for you guys in the Nordic countries. You've got amazing talent, and there's a lot of uh, opportunities for you guys to be potentially acquired by a bigger player. We also see higher and higher investments from top Asian publishers. Um, last year, Tencent spent over $22 billion in game deals, which is insane. Uh, it's a ton of cash. And there's also new players entering the market. Uh, Apple Oven really s recently started Lion Studio, which is specialized in uh, uh, hyper-casual games. Bungie received major investment from NetEase Games to work on mobile games. Activision obviously acquired King, but now the rumor has it that they're working a lot closer together on mobile games. Uh, so we expect to see more and more of their like, top franchises like Call of Duty to be on the mobile platforms. Epic Games uh, decided to kind of release Fortnite outside of the Google Play Store. Uh, and I expect, since they're seeing such success on mobile, they're just going to like release more and more titles. But it's much harder to break through. Um, average CPIs have vastly increased. I think right now uh, it's $12 in the US, and globally it's about like $5 to $8. So like the people before me were saying, you need a very, very large amount of cash to be able to see your game grow and invest over time in its performance. And then, you know, it's sad to say, but I think we're at maturation, or we're really close to maturation, right? There's little movements in and out of the top charts. 80% uh, of the top grossing games are about 18 months old. So we see really the people that are installed are not moving, which means that, and they're obviously making a lot of money. They're investing a lot in keeping their product relevant, so it's just harder for everybody else that's not one of those big players to surface to the top. So seven games make above 100 million, 65 make 10 to 100, and then we start, you know, more and more companies are doing like less and less. I think I've in, in made a, a mistake right there, but you get the drift. It's like the vast majority of games make basically no money. There's very few people that make significant amount of money. Uh, about 500 basically make above $1 million a year. Uh, and $1, $1 million a year for a video game is just not that much in this day and age. So how to survive and thrive uh, in this real landscape? One, you need to have really performing products. Um, those are the top performers benchmark if you look at the top 30. Right now, the average is you need to be at above 40% D1, above 20% D7, and above 10% D30. If you're not hitting those KPIs, I would advise to potentially go back into soft launch, iterate on the product until you get there. Um, it's going to be very hard for you to generate the revenue you need to uh, be successful without uh, that type of retention. LTV standard are up. Same thing, it's the top 30. You need $1.70 90 day ARPU, $70.27 90 day RPPU, uh, and you need about like close to 4% paying users. Those are pretty tough numbers to get. Uh, it takes a lot of work for us to get to those numbers. Um, so, yeah, I'm being a bit ominous, but it's just the reality of, of the market right now. So, yeah. If you're not one of those like, you know, top 10 companies uh, in the US or the world, you need a, a vast amount of cash. So you'll need to be potentially supported by established organization with proven performance and product marketing ability. The ability to invest UA at scale, 
to see return on that investment, to hit um, you know, the app stores for featuring, to get the type of marketing that you need uh, on TV, on radio, uh, online, anything that can kind of generate buzz and attraction for your product. Uh, it's something that takes a lot of expertise and something that potentially you as developers, if you're not one of those big players once again, do need. We've seen also, you know, a great example of that is the rise of mega publishers, right? King that now I think they've reached a level of like maturity of how big their operations can go internally and they're starting to work as a publisher as well. They're working with Snowprint, they're working with Midoki where they have two. Uh, SourceGuard recently released, really fun game, I love it. And uh, they're working with Midoki on uh, Knights of Fury which is very interesting positioning for King and I'm really curious to see how that works. So outside even just as you know, the result your product needs to hit, um, we're moving to a format where content I is really key. There's companies that have done it extremely well. I'm thinking about like, you know, Rovio with Angry Birds, Seriously with Best Fiends, uh, Supercell with, with the Clash franchise. You can think of your products as like isolated games. You, think, you need to think about it as like universe that you're building. Uh, that's where really the, the upside is going to be, is for you to build franchises that are going to have a long uh, lifetime and that you're going to be able to sustain over multiple years and replicate into multiple arenas of entertainment. So us, Jam City, the way we're positioning ourselves in this really competitive market uh, is pretty simple. As I was saying, um, we see ourselves as like more than a gaming company. We see ourselves as a true mobile entertainment company with franchises and IPs that live across platforms and content types. And that has really been something that, you know, became the reality of our business in the past few years, where we've decided to stop looking at our products as games, where we need to see just like positive return on ad spend or positive return on investment. But we're really looking at them as like, hey, how do we grow those franchises to become more than games, to become potentially TV shows or movies or books, anything that suddenly we're going to be able to like expand our reach even beyond uh, just the mobile uh, device itself. So I'm really annoyed that this moved, but we're going to continue developing and publishing high-profile original and branded games, and we want to extend the fans' relationship beyond a linear narrative, adding story dimensions, events, choices, and, and social interactions. Um, one thing we've done in terms of talent is that we've hired you know, people from Netflix, we've hired people from Telltale, uh, from Marvel, from DC Comics. We used to have no narrative drivers within the company, or very limited, and now it's becoming a bigger and bigger function, and it's playing a bigger and bigger role in how we're uh, working on our marketing strategy and our product narrative. It doesn't have to be you know, a ton of copy in our games, but every line that a character says needs to really fit into that uh, overall narrative. So for the next couple of years, uh, we've got successful core games franchises with multiple exciting new games in development. I can't obviously talk about them. There's just two that I can mention because we announced them. Um, World War Do, that is a PvP game uh, done by our Bogota team. It's really exciting. We released, uh, we're about to release in the next couple of days uh, a trailer. I think you should watch it when it comes out because it's going to give you a lot of uh, actual insights on everything I said about how to build more than a mobile video game, but how to build an entertainment franchise. And the second one is Wild Things. Uh, we released the trailer a couple of weeks ago. And that's something that we're really uh, believing in very strongly and we're you know, fast firing in many, many areas of entertainment to see it succeed. So that's it. It was pretty short and to the point. And do you guys have any questions? Oh, you caught me going there. That's <laughs> you ended that suddenly. That was, that was very good. But uh, do we have any questions for, for Jeremy? Jam City or... Uh, very, very uh, successful company, done incredibly well despite that, uh, despite that competitive marketplace. We must have a question out there. <sighs> okay, all right then, I'll, I'll, I'll have to take this on. Uh, so what's, what's, what's next? What's, the, what's the, the most exciting thing you've got ahead that you're allowed to talk about? So I'm not allowed to talk about all, much. If you're not allowed to talk about it, you can do that, <laughs> sure. it's fine. We're all friends here. Yes. Um, Nothing will leave the room. You know, I think there's always like multiple pillars. One, it's keeping our core franchises relevant and seeing them 
uh, succeed, grow, at least not decay, um, which is a challenge in and of itself. Two, building those new franchises. And three, obviously, there's everything else that we're doing that I can talk about. So three pillars. So uh, we'll be, Jeremy will be talking about this in the party later. So buy him a couple of drinks. Many drinks. We'll Many drinks, and he'll share, he'll, he'll share everything uh, with you. One last question before I let you go. Um, this, this is our kind of trends uh, talk here. You've covered a lot of different things in that. But what, what would you say in the next 12 months, where something Gem City are working on or not working on, will, will be a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, the biggest, most important sort of trend or tech that's coming down? Is it, you know, is it hyper casual? You guys are going kind of more mid-core away from casual a little bit, but... Uh. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a very hype person. Like, there's very few hypes that I believe in. Um, I think a lot of those business models have weaknesses. It's easy to just get excited about things like hyper casual or blockchain, but those markets are a lot more complex and challenging than they may seem, despite some players finding success right now. Um, I don't think the market is going to change as radically as some people expect. I think we're just going to see consolidation, we're going to see a lot of the same products succeeding, and we're going to see very little movement uh, in the App Store. So maybe that's the trend. It's just this is a market that is reaching maturity. Okay.